And good Thursday morning to you. This is the Preterist Power Hour, a ministry provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network, which you can learn more about by visiting powerofpreterism.com. I'm excited to be here with you, always encouraged to be here uh, for this session of what we like to call an hour of power. Today, we're going to do some review of some of the resources and discussions that we've been having. And uh, I know I'm excited to get in on what we like to call a throwback Thursday. So uh, I'm Mike Miano. I'm the pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church, and I'm also the director of the Power of Preterism Network. And uh, we have a lot of exciting things that we're going to be looking forward to in the next six months uh, of our work here at the Power of Preterism Network. And of course, uh, with our podcasts, the Preterist Power Hour. So uh, I'm excited for all of that. I have the privilege of be being uh, helped out and, and working with Edward and Jonathan Buttry as board members. And again, I just want to express that privilege and lift up testimony in that regard this morning before I hand over to the time to my brother, Edward. And Edward, I want to encourage you, introduce yourself and lead us in a word of prayer as you customary, customarily do. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. My name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church, also a board member of the Power Predators of Network. And at this time, I would like to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, please go before us. Thank you for this day and uh, for all that the pastor has in store for us this morning. You know, I believe it will be exciting and something to ponder and that, you know, we may listen intently, give pastor proper focus and clarity of mind and thought that what he presents to us will provoke us to conversation and develop and fellowship and that we may, you know, gain clarity, healing and strategy this morning in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Uh, may we just pray for a continued peace that surpasses all understanding across the world to in the minds and hearts of believers that need it. Uh, a common, uh, you know, sharing of that peace, of course, among those that are not believers, and also uh, just praise for what Christ has provided to us, uh, the peace that he provides, uh, that continues. He is the Prince of Peace, truly is the Prince of Peace, and uh, he provides that peace. So let's just pray and praise God for that this morning. Amen. Amen. So I'm excited. Uh, if I may just mention a couple announcements. Um, I know Throwback Thursday is all about getting into the resources and the things that we've uh, been talking about. We've had Elder Steve Hernandez here on the program. We had Larry Siegel on the program uh, in the last week, into, week or two. So it's been a blessing to, uh, to host these programs. And uh, I might mention uh, one announcement I'll be sharing. Uh, we've talked about creation and Genesis a lot here on our program. We had a whole week where we focused on uh, understanding Genesis through, uh, you know, through a preterist lens, if you will. And um, I have the opportunity uh, next Thursday, Thursday, June 23rd, to be speaking on the Harry Ticks. Uh, they, they have a show, a program that they do every week. Uh, it's a private Zoom group. Uh, however, it's not recorded. So you have to kind of be a part of the session. And it's a very light discussion. I'll share some thoughts and then we all get to participate in a sort of panel like style. So June 23rd at uh, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, uh, I'll be sharing the covenant creation view on that program. So just want to let everyone know that. I just saw that uh, notification pop up on my social media and wanted to go ahead and uh, make that opportunity for discussion and so forth available to you. So uh, what I wanted to do, again, I want to go back to a lot of thoughts that we've shared over the last couple of weeks, uh, uh, Edward, but uh, what I want to do first on Tuesday, I had mentioned Fulfilled Magazine. Again, a great resource. I think it's a resource everyone should plug into and at least sign up to get a copy. That way you could give, if you don't want to read it, you could give it to someone else. And uh, I think it's a great opportunity to get the word out. A nice full colored magazine. They also have a website. You could go to, uh, go to Google and just put in Fulfilled Magazine. Uh, you might put in Fulfilled Communications Group, which is the organization that publishes it, and you'll be able to find the different uh, details about the magazine as well as past issues. So uh, I had mentioned that there was a, a uh, post on Facebook that talked about Fulfilled Magazine, and I wanted to share it. So Edward, if you don't mind, I wanted to bring us in to those thoughts. Uh, I'm not going to mention the person. However, I'll mention the thoughts that were shared. Is that cool? Amen. All right, good deal. And uh, why I wanted to do this, I want to make mention of this now. One of our goals with the Power of Preterism Network and ultimately with the Preterist Power Hour is to foster networking, discussion, 
um, so that we all could kind of be of a common mind. I feel like we're all doing different things and different resources are constantly being provided, which again is to the praise of God, as Larry talked about on Tuesday. Um, you, you know, things have really grown since the 80s when preterism was a, uh, what many seen as a new perspective coming into the church. Uh, so now we see that it's definitely, uh, you know, been of great influence. I love what uh, Gamaliel told, uh, I think it was Gamaliel in the book of Acts where, you know, they were coming up against the, 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 the disciples and they said, well, if this is of God, it will, per it will persist no matter what. You, you'll find yourself fighting against God. But if it's not of God, leave them alone and it'll eventually die out. And uh, I love that we do see the power and the advancement of preterism in many places. Might not necessarily be called that, but we see the effect, the ethic, if you will, the ethos of the preterist mindset, audience relevance. Edward, you were just at a Bible study last night where we, we saw, uh, you, you know, audience relevance from someone that's not a preterist, Ray Vanderlaan, in a great series he has that the world may know. And um, he, he focused in on the necessity of audience relevance. So we really see that ethic de developing across the board in the church. And that's to the praise of God. Now, um, but, but I say all of this because part of our goal with the Preterist Power Hour is to give people a place to air out their thoughts. Now, many times we have those that are here with us that uh, we get to unmute and have joined with us in the discussion. Uh, there's unfortunately many that don't want to be here in the Zoom session, but do comment on Facebook. And uh, then, of course, there's those that I don't know if they've heard about the resource. But I try to peruse the internet often. I've mentioned this to you, Edward, where I like to go through and, and try to see where the preterist mind is. And I do that by going through the different Facebook groups. I visit different preterist resources from many of our brothers, Don Preston, Ward Fenley, Daniel Rogers, Jonathan Buttrey, uh, and many others, where I just see where the frame of thought is in the preterist community and try to say, you know, what can we do to serve that and be ministers to that? Because again, that's our goal in the Power of Preterism Network to be ministers to the advancement and the power of preterism. So that being said, uh, someone had shared some thoughts about Fulfilled Magazine, and I wanted to just air it out and welcome some discussion. So as we mentioned before, before we went live, uh, I'll unmute the mics of Zach and Richard who are here in our session, and I'll also pay attention to the Facebook posts there. And uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, welcome some conversation around what was said here by this brother and see if uh, maybe we can help his thoughts, or maybe we can uh, provide some further beneficial insights on, you know, listening to what he had to say and allowing his thoughts to have some space, and then what we how we might respond to that. So sound good? Yeah, good. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, hear what this brother had to say. I just got my copy of Fulfilled Magazine, and as usual, it's full of junk. You want to know why preterists are not a real force for God? because most cannot keep their eye on the truth of scripture and hold the course. That's why. Michael Day says the New Testament is perpetual, yet all typical charismatic morons, or as all typical charismatic morons, he quotes the Acts of the Apostles that was coming to an end. All of the Acts was fulfilling the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, and it started on the day of Pentecost with Peter's reference to Joel chapter 2. Paul, Paul quotes Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, in reference to the lost 10 tribes, and in Romans 9, 26, reiterates it. And did I say these things were all coming to an end? All things being fulfilled means they come and then they went. The only thing perpetual about this new covenant is that, quote, that which is perfect has come, that which was in part has been done away, 1 Corinthians 13. This is perpetual for sure. There are no tongues in a real Christian church, and every first-year Christian should be out of the confusion at this point and realize there are no more prophecies. This wildfire and fanaticism in charismatic systems is nothing more than futurism wearing a dress. These kinds of preterist claims, these kind of preterist claim things fulfilled not in 1 Corinthians 13, the whole chapter, Paul is dealing with a fanatical group of people who within 70 years of his care for this church were no more. Tongues and prophecy were called signs, gifts for a good reason. They were signs, gifts to the first covenant people, to the Jews, the Jews. Peter's vision in Acts 11 verses 1 through 8 and subsequent visit to Cornelius with his Jewish entourage was evidence 
of God's attempt at separation of Jews and Gentiles in the rear view mirror. Jews did not go to Gentiles' houses, even though under Moses, a Gentile convert was according to the law a Jew, just as Uriah was known of God in adoption and David killed him for his wife. Just a note. The middle wall of separation in the temple was not of God. See Prophecies in Tongues, Berean Bible, 1 Corinthians 14. Brothers, stop thinking like children in regard to evil infants, but in your thinking be mature. This is 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20 through 21 in the Berean Study Bible. Verse 21, it is written in the law, by strange tongues and foreign lips, I will speak to this people. But even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. Also, look at Isaiah 28, 11. Indeed, with mocking lips and foreign tongues, he will speak to his people. Paul was teaching rightly to rightly divide the word, and 1 Corinthians 13 is a perfect example of his knowing that the perfect to come was not far off. AD 70 was very close, and God's men all knew it. Being filled with the Holy Ghost in the first century Jerusalem meant speaking in tongues or having another God-inspired gift of knowledge or prophecy or healings, and all these were for Jerusalem, and all were signs, gifts, that came with the gospel of Christ. Today, God's hand is not short, but he will not go against his words through his apostles to the Gentiles. Tongues and prophecies are tied together for good reason in 1 Corinthians 13. They are both close to being fulfilled, completed, no longer needed because there's no more Jerusalem nor Jews under an old covenant. And again, did I tell you this is perpetual and will never change? Every single person claiming tongues today is a liar, just as Hal Lindsey and Jack Van Impey who claim they have a word in eschatology about the end times. I don't know how Michael Day can be so confused about all things being fulfilled, and yet keeps quoting and getting all fouled up from the Acts of the Apostles. If you're a preterist, you know there are many things that no longer have meaning for us in 2022. Don't believe me? Look at Acts 15. And the end result was verses, verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these, that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from all things strangled and from fornication from which you keep yourselves. You shall do well. Farewell. Why? Because all of the things that even Jesus hated was fornication and still does to this day. Of all the things that even Jesus hated was fornication and still does to this day. Excuse me. There is not one thing more damaging to family and children than this one thing. It also passes blood where in recent years we now know infected blood brings viruses. But circumcision and keeping Moses law was not on the table for Gentiles. However, the Jews were another story. The moving from one covenant to the new covenant would have been as easy as listening to the prophets and John the Baptist. Just remember this, Michael Day. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 12. Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But then, that, that, when that which is perfect is come, excuse me, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. And if you need help, Michael, to interpret this portion of scripture, you may need to get back, back to the basics of being a real preterist, a full preterist. So, Thank you to that brother and gentleman who uh, shared those thoughts. And if I might just say one thing, and then I'm interested to hear where you're at, Brother Edward. So, and I'm going to, of course, unmute uh, Richard and Zach's mic here in a moment as well. Uh, I'll say this. This was in response to the article entitled Charismatic Preterism in the most recent Fulfilled Magazine. And if I might just cite this, because this is what I read in our last program. And it explains why the Charismatic Preterist article was in this Preterist magazine. While most full Preterists believe, this is Brian Martin, the publisher of the Fulfilled Magazine writing. While most full Preterists believe, as do many Futurists, that the gifts of the spirit, Charismata, have ceased. There are full Preterists who believe otherwise. Michael Day, one of the driving forces behind the Kingdom Bible, 
is one of those individuals. I asked Michael if he would like to provide an article defending the continuation of the gifts post AD 70, and he graciously agreed. Gary Parrish and Terry Cashian also helped with the article. So, the futurist view, Christianity, global Christianity, has divides in regards to charismatic and cessationist. And there are also others, as you know, I've talked about this, Edward, in the middle, who don't feel comfortable with necessarily some of the claims of cessationist and some of the claims of the charismatic community. We know, for example, in the preterist circles, the Church of Christ tends to be cessationist. And that carries into quite a few things. For example, they don't believe that you could be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's other things that happen within that, or that the work of the Holy Spirit is happening today, or that miracles are happening today. There's a lot of things that the Church of Christ believe doctrinally, that those that might not necessarily be charismatic, myself, I'll speak for myself, I'm not charismatic, but I'm not cessationist. And I know I speak for a large group. So there's a middle ground. So I just want to say this against that first article I read there, or the first Facebook post, we need to calm down. And just like we talked about with Larry Siegel, we need to welcome conversation and, and we need to stop making all these titles and making it more and more confusing for each other, uh, where we can just say, this is what I'm understanding these texts to be talking about. These are the texts that I'm connecting because he had went to Acts chapter 15, which you know, Edward, I've leaned in on a lot as well. Uh, I talk about, I bring that text up a lot. I brought it up in my recent presentation in Alabama, where I talked about conscience and conviction and um, you know, I talked about Acts chapter 15 as one of those texts where people bring up, these are the things that scripture says you should not do. Um, so I say that because I think that really what we need to do is I appreciate Brian Martin for allowing Michael Day and Terry Cashian and these gentlemen to participate in putting an article out there to start conversation. That's not to say that we have to agree with them hook, line, and sinker. That's not to say that we have to agree with, let's say, William Bell and Don Preston and Holger Neubauer hook, line, and sinker, the cessationist, what I would call more of a hardcore cessationist view. Um, I think that there's a healthy middle ground, and I think we need to be comfortable and admit that this is not just a preterist discussion. This is a discussion that transcends, you know, into the futurist paradigm, uh, where they still have kind of some, you, you know, you can't say it's preterist because there's futurists that believe in cessationism. That would be my point. So we need to be cautious with that. What are your thoughts, Edward? Well, when it comes to the gifts of the spirit, you know, uh, I believe that if it's the edifying of the church, then okay, you know, but uh, if it's not for the edifying of the church, then I would, you know, uh, uh, not question it, but I, I would say that that should be done at home. <laughs> Well, that's, and I think there's a place for that discussion as well. So what I ask you, though, let's get a bit particular here. What do you mean by edification of the church? If I mean that, church. okay, like, say if a person was to speak in tongues, right? It should be for the edifying of the church to where maybe the church would understand, you know, their, their, their passion, or, you know, or, or, you know, what's being said. Because why get up and mumble and no one understands? That's right. like being a barbarian, according to the scripture. So, so do you think it's fair to say that if it causes confusion, it's not edifying? Right. Okay. I, and I could agree with that. Uh, and I do think there's a place for that. Obviously, we see in 1 Corinthians 13 and 14, a bit of discussion about that. And uh, I'm of the same view as you. Uh, I think that if you find it edifying and it's building you up, it's not causing confusion in your personal walk. And if it's not causing confusion in the assembly, uh, and if it is, then you need to do it elsewhere. Uh, but if you find that to be something edifying, then yes, that, that's, you know, but don't demand that I have to do it. Now, this is where the conversation gets a bit strange, where we know in a lot of the circles that speak in tongues, that they speak of this baptism of fire that you do, or baptism of the spirit that you need to undergo, where you speak in tongues. Now, I don't agree with that. I think that's, you know, I don't think there's any greater gift. Uh, personally, I believe that. This is where I'm in the sort of middle ground there. Uh, I'm okay with people doing that. Uh, but I also don't believe that the spirit, the, the gift of tongues that we read about in the book of Acts has anything to do with miraculous mumbling, if you will. Uh, I believe that it has more to do with um, nations hearing their language being spoken. 
And mm -hmm. uh, while, you know, it could be argued, you know, well, you don't know if that person's speaking another language uh, that I don't I don't think that was the key. So I would agree with the article that was written uh, in some regards, the, po the Facebook post. But I haven't had opportunity to be quite honest uh, in, to engage this article in Fulfilled Magazine yet. Uh, I'm a part of charismatic Facebook preterist groups. I've been, you know, Cindy Coates, as Larry Siegel talked about on Tuesday. Uh, we have many charismatic preterists, uh, Cindy Coates, Lynn Hiles, uh, Glenn Hill might even uh, fit within that category. So I welcome conversation. And I've always said Johnny Ova, Apostle Johnny Ova, right here from Long Island, uh, Sound of Heaven. Um, you know, he obviously, uh, the, he, Johnny Ova, you know, we call him Johnny Ova. We don't get caught up in the apostle thing. Uh, he calls himself apostle pastor. It depends in what context he's using that phrase. Uh, and I feel comfortable with that as well. Uh, so, um, yeah, I just think that it's something that should become an evolving conversation. I've unmuted Zach. I see Zach's unmuted. I'm curious to hear where Zach stands with some of that. And uh, how do you think, Zach, that we should, uh, what do you think? And then how do you think we, we should move forward with that conversation? Hey, good morning, guys. Um, well, I, I think, first of all, I, I think we need to, as you said, um, take it down a notch in the rhetoric. Um, I think a lot of the verbiage used in the article was inappropriate, but be that as it may, the I tend to I'm I'm somewhat in your camp on this, Michael. I, I probably would be considered a little bit more secessionist, maybe even than you, but I'm not even sure these terms are really getting at the issue. I mean, this seems to be a pretty broad question that the preterist community, you know, is still in the process of answering. And that's, you know, what now, what, how do we understand where we've come from uh, pre AD 70? And how do we take that into a life lived after AD 70? Um, I tend to take a fairly organic view of the church and see, you know, from the birth of the church to 8070, it seems to be that we have a maturing and a growing up process for the church as a body. Um, and it, the, the word of God seems to indicate that there's something happens at the destruction of the temple and the end of the old covenant that signals something to the church about its growth in that we're fully entering into a new covenant age and i mean i have to believe that the church you know matured to the point where it's able to live victoriously in that new covenant age now there was a lot of things that happened in that, you know, first century pre-70 context that were for the building up of the body um, that are specifically pointed out as being for the building up of the body. Um, obviously, you know, tongues and the interpretation of tongues and um, some of these prophecies and those sort of things. But if, if you think about it, when, when you're built up, when you, when you get to a certain point in your own life where you've matured to the point where you're ready to leave, Lord willing, leave your parents' house, um, you, you don't necessarily, and you shouldn't forget everything that you've learned up until that point. I think a lot of people think of, you know, what happened in the first century as simply you know, things we don't need to do anymore. Isn't that great? And things we don't need to think about anymore. Isn't that great? Now we can just do our own thing. But, you know, when you've, if you've properly matured as a human being and have left your parents' house, you should have, you should be equipped by the things you've learned and you should have, you know, these different um, skills and, you know, different understandings that allow you to operate successfully in the world. I think that's sort of the same thing with, you know, the church. We've been built up and we've been equipped with, you know, certain things. And, you know, we're going to have to exercise those 
to you know live maturely and victoriously in a new covenant age. Now you don't you don't. <laughs> Hopefully, when you're you're you've left your parents' house, you're not and you're riding a bike. You still don't have training wheels on. There's some things that you know were there to teach you certain things that you don't necessarily need anymore. But you should you know appreciate that that ha you've had them. But there are also things that you definitely still need and that you're always going to need and that you were equipped with. Um, but I mean, this is the big question, and you know, I I, I don't. I don't necessarily think that there's a lot of edifying things going on in, you know, with speaking in tongues necessarily. Um, but again, this is going to try to, we're going to have to try to figure it out and we're going to have to, you know, show grace to one another in, you know, trying to figure out what that means. And, I, and I'd rather have that conversation among people who were, you know, showing grace to one another and, allowing for people in different contexts to see what, what that means for their church and for them individually. Um, so I guess that's my first reaction, if that makes any sense. Yeah, if I may respond to some of the things that you said, uh, I thought you brought out a lot of great points. And I do want to be clear, my, my goal, I, I don't intend to exhaust charismatic, you know, Christianity, charismatic preterism on this program. I wanted to just bring this up in a matter of, um, fostering some discussion and maybe tabling this for, you know, a, a further examination. And uh, I might say a couple things first. The first thing, uh, hopefully what I was getting at before, that within the charismatic community, there's a lot of difference. And I think that's kind of like the, what we do with covenant creation and things like that. There's a lot of difference in these different groups. So we need to allow each person, each insight to be explained rather than categorizing everyone. I think that's key. Um, you know, I definitely appreciate uh, what Zach brought out there. Uh, I want to say that my view of tongues, uh, just to put this on the record here, uh, is that they're foreign languages. I, I believe they're foreign languages being understood. I think there's a miraculous thing happening in the first century. This is where I would probably fit in the cessationist box. Um, I believe that they were a, a miraculous sign to the first century to demonstrate the breaking down of God speaking to nations, speaking to Jew and Gentile. It was showing that each person, God speaks to people in ways they understand, that ethic we often bring up. So uh, that's what I believe was going on. And I believe that now that that gift has been planted in the church, as Zach's rightly bringing out there, you don't forget the things that you learned prior. Now, through the spirit, we do speak to nations. I think there's a worship song that actually sings that and says that, you know, speak to nations. And I believe that's the key, that the gospel now does because of the foundational things that happened in the first century. Those, uh, the, the gospel speaks to nations and in Christ speaks to nations through us, through the church, uh, which again is obviously if we're speaking to nations, we're speaking in different tongues. So uh, just something I wanted to make mention of on my view there. Um, and I believe it fits when you do the, you know, the, the study. Um, there might be, you know, I, I've been in discussion with some about 1 Corinthians 13 and 14. And again, this leans in on something else Zach brought up where, um, you know, what that's being highlighted there is something being done in partial, you know, something being partially seen and understood, whereas the maturing process will bring you into fully understanding. And uh, what often is brought up, uh, shout out to Johnny Ova, would, he would always say, well, if you have something in part, that mean, and when you get it in full, you don't get rid of that which you had in part, as Zach was rightly bringing out. And um, so I think there's more that needs to be said and exhausted in a contextual manner. I'm excited, actually, here in probably the next few months, we'll be le leaning in on 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in our sermon series uh, here at the Blue Point Bible Church. So uh, maybe we'll dig in on some resources in that, if not, foster further discussion about charismatic Christianity. And uh, I do want to encourage folks, you know, a good foundation, I would imagine, is getting to that article in Fulfilled Magazine and reading that, seeing what's being said from the mouth of men within the preterist movement that uh, do believe in, in the charismatic. And, and this is a foundational article. And then let's build from there uh, into discussion. So I might reach out to them and welcome them on the program. And, uh, you know, and then we'll hear from the other perspective, you know, the cessationist. And who knows, maybe before you know it, we can have a preterist debate on cessationist and charismatic in a good spirit and good discussion, maybe a panel, if you will. And uh, I think that could be very beneficial. Richard, I see you're unmuted. I wanted to give you a moment to share your thoughts. Yes. <clears throat> good morning, everybody. I hope my morning. thinking is clear. I literally climbed out of bed 
and um, heard one of my favorite topics uh, as to whether or not it's, uh, you know, we're in a cessationist age or not. Mm -hmm. um, I do not believe that we are uh, for a number of reasons, but I want to actually bring it to a subject that I always bring it back to. There are emotional worshipers and there are ritual worshipers. Mm -hmm. There are some people that just believe that no emotion or spontaneity should be involved in Christianity at all. They believe it should be a very rigid, uh, organized, you know, predetermined type of worship. And they don't like any emotion. And these are the same people that will jump and shout for their favorite team uh, that wins, you know, <laughs> or, or curse the one that loses. Um, I have noticed that there is a consistent, among cessationists, there is a consistent type of worshiper. And they do not believe in emotion. They see it as unnecessary. And when, when the spirit moves, there is always wind. There's movement, there's emotion. You find that throughout scripture, that whenever the spirit's moving, there's emotion. There's some type of demonstration of, of, of you know, whatever, how, whatever you wanna call it. That really is the issue when it comes to people that are always condemning any type of charismatic worship. They are ritual worshipers. They are not wrong because I believe that there are different types of worshipers uh, and, and there's different styles of worship and there's different types of worship. And uh, I think that uh, many preterists need to understand that and they don't. Uh, and the interesting thing is people that believe in emotional worship many times will condemn those that are ritual worshipers as being dead, cold, you know, unspiritual. I have found that not to be true. You know, and you and so many others are a classic example. So that really is the issue uh, that I have found. They that with with people that are strong cessationists, they don't want you know they where they will condemn, they'll even mock sometimes uh, any spontaneity in worship. Um, second question that this raises, and I often I, I brought this up with Don one time: How involved is God in our individual lives? That really is another question that people that talk about cessationism need to ask themselves because many people that are preterists always seem to talk as if God is not really involved in our personal lives in a personal way where he has any you know, guidance to our life or purpose to our life or calling to our life, giftings in our life. Uh, they just write that off and it's all about preterism. And once you get preterism, that's it. Don't look any further, you know, and, 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 and don't, you know, God has nothing to do with your personal life. He doesn't care whether you go left or right or, you know, I have a problem with that. Yeah, uh, I do. because you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, however, I'm also somebody that was raised in charismatic. I mean, I'm talking crazy charismatic, you know, I'm talking about services where people end up on the floor and, you know, the whole thing. Uh, we call them carpet meetings. We have our own terms for them. Uh, but I've also been. I've also been in the presence of God that's so strong sometimes I can barely stand up. Amen. And I'm telling you, I, I, I've had it happen to me. You know, I, there's some services I walk in, as soon as I hit, walk in the door, I, it, it's like a cloud hits me. You know, um, I really think there's room for both. And if one is not for you, avoid it. That's what I say. If it's not for you, just avoid it. But don't say they're not saved. Don't say they're immature don't say they're this and they're that you know what i'm saying because i'm telling you there may come a time in your life where you have an experience and i believe you had one one time with prophecy somebody prophesied to you and i happened to be online and you said it and i got up you know i got immediately got on and, and gave you a witness to it because that was exactly if i would have said i think god is telling you that would be exactly the same thing that i would have told you that day and I believe that was a genuine word. Now, the problem with emotional worship, just like the problem with ritual worship is, everybody keeps trying to repeat the past. A lot of people always like to force an emotional experience. You can get carried away with emotionalism, and you can also get carried away with ritual worship. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Um, so 
I, I'm gonna make, I, I made an, another thing here. I, I'm probably the only charismatic that'll say, will you please stop forcing people into speaking in tongues? Mm. <laughs> just stop it. Will you all just stop it? These, these meetings, these tarry meetings, they call them. Well, you know, you try to get everybody to speak in tongues. You know, I've seen so much in that era. Here's what I tell people. If during worship, you begin to hear tongues in your mind, you may be a tongue talk. Hmm. I can be around people that are not charismatic and I won't hear it. I won't hear it. But if I'm in a charismatic thing where people allow for that, I will hear it. Uh, and I don't expect people to understand that. But if you, it, there are just some people that it's not, it's not for you, just avoid it. You know, Paul was very clear. Everyone thinks it's always a, a language. Paul was very clear that people are speaking in an unknown tongue. Paul brought a whole different aspect into this thing that, that a lot of uh, preterists like to avoid. And I hope I'm not going on too long. Just tell no. me if I am. But this is a subject that's very important to me. We got to stop this division. If it's not for you, don't go to those types of churches that allow it. But don't, you know, just don't, let's, let's stop condemning each other. Personally, we are in the time where God is to manifest his kingdom in a way that has never been done before in human, humankind. And yet we have rivers being parted. We have, you know, dead being raised in the Old Testament. Everything that you hear happening in the New Testament also happened in the Old at one point or another, including tongues. I, I believe it's in uh, Genesis. There's, there's some part, I, I forget where it was, but it was a very strange thing that's recorded in scripture that's probably not talked about by anybody so you know um i see ritual meetings ritualistic meetings that are so boring <laughs> sorry to say sometimes that i mean i went to a catholic thing recently I, I was invited because of a friend of mine that passed away and and i thought this will be interesting you know now that i've changed and let me see how i react to my upbringing which was catholicism and i swear in 10 minutes i was ready to fall asleep i you know and this is not to knock them, okay? There are many sincere Catholics, but I just can't, I just cannot deal with that sort of worship. You know, I, I can sit through it, like, you know, but it's not the kind of thing that I, I seek for myself. So this is a very individual thing. And, and we, have to, we have to stop condemning people. I appreciate the fact that you are at least open to some uh, gifting. I can see people talking in tongues. And let me tell you, I, I, I've seen, I have been in meetings where people have spoken actual languages. I have been in meetings where, I mean, there were probably 1,500 people there and they were all making, you know, shouting and, and dancing and praising the Lord and everyone stops at once. And this woman stood up and came out with the most beautiful tongues I'd ever heard in my life. Everybody stopped at once. And there was such a silence, except for her voice and with no microphone, it was heard everywhere in that room. And this was a big theater. And then she interpreted it. And it, it was just so amazing. The problem is people try to re, in my opinion, many charismatics try to keep reproducing this all the time. You know what I mean? They, mm -hmm. they, they always, I mean, I can show you churches like I was raised in just the other day. I was watching one on, on, the, on the internet and, and these people, they work up emotion. You yeah. know, these are the kind of churches that they work it up. It, they, they don't have, they don't believe in a service that does not involve, you know, yelling and shouting and jumping and dancing. They just don't believe that you can have a service like that. And then one day they had a service on same church where they came a silence in their service and it was like everybody was just dropping to their knees and i'm dropping to my knees i'm trying to wash dishes and i'm just whoa you know this was it was a cloud that just came in my apartment you know and i was right in line with this so sometimes it's adequate sometimes it's not sometimes you're going to feel well i don't know if that's necessary sometimes you know just Realize this, if it bothers you, don't get involved with it. Go to services 
that you're, you know, that appeal to you. Um, end time, end times. What I, I wrote, made a few notes here. Yeah, that that's about that's about all I wanted to say. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that, Richard, and and I hope that you know I agree. I, I think that uh, we we need to just be speaking to the people that we can you know agree with, and 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 if we can't. Again, I'm comfortable with tongues. I might not agree that, you know, that's the unknown languages that uh, Paul's speaking about, which again, I actually, I want to, uh, we're going to have a future conversation about this. We're going to really outline this and we could hear where we're saying things because I know charismatics that will say it's not in scripture, but it's something that's beneficial to their life. And they've, they've found it, you know, uh, and I, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the variety. I'm okay with those that say it is the scripture. I'm okay with, you know, and I think when I say, okay, I mean, my temperament doesn't get frustrated when I'm around those that disagree with my understanding of tongues. And if your temperament does get frustrated, I agree with you, Richard, go to a different place. <laughs> you know, um, there's, let's face it, there's some that in our community that don't like instrumental music, uh, you, you know, that have said, you know, I won't come to a worship service where you're calling that worship of Jesus Christ and using instruments. Uh, that's fine. You, you know, if I might bring up a personal one. So Ward Fenley and I, we go back and forth on this and we brought this up at conferences and kind of jested about it. Ward has this, he demands that you agree that there is no sin. And it frustrates me because I say, well, no, there is sin. Uh, it's not the sin of violating the law of Moses, but there's those that sin not in the likeness of Adam. And we kind of go back and forth and then he has his own explanation of that text that differs than mine. And we just sit there and it kind of gets to a point where we're both holding on and we're both saying, this is what we're going to say no matter what. And, you know, I'm okay with that. I don't find that I have to disagree. I understand where, why Ward's saying that we have to kind of get to a point where we agree that we all carry presuppositions into these things. And uh, when we do, uh, that's not always wrong. Some of our presuppositions are healthy. They bolster who we are uh, as Richard highlighted their emotion. Uh, I think emotion is beautiful and it's healthy and it needs to be expressed. I don't think that by the way, I know that. And I agree with what Richard said about that being found in scripture. And uh, I believe it's all throughout scripture, God being an emotional God. Uh, God is a jealous God. Is that not an emotion? God is a love. God is love. Uh, God, you know, we see plenty of examples where healthy men and women of God express emotion. And, and I believe that's important. So uh, that being said, we have to admit our emotions are a bit different than each other. No man is alike. No man or woman is alike in that regard. So that's going to lean in on the way that we're explaining certain biblical truths. And we need to learn how to, I think part of a maturing movement, if you will, is learning how to have those conversations without calling each other morons to reflect back to what Zach said, uh, you know, not using, not even, you don't have to even use name calling. Sometimes the frame of the conversation, the way you're talking about someone else sharing their thoughts uh, could become offensive. And I think, you know, and I know that as a maturing movement, we need to learn how to do that far better as Edward knows, I bring this up often, listen to agree. Uh, that's why I make that my, my view. I, many of you know my ministry. I go to all sorts of events. I'm at all sorts of, uh, yesterday I found myself in Chinatown, New York City, uh, in the middle of some sort of Asian celebration. And uh, you know, I didn't get annoyed and frustrated. I sat there, I listened, I looked around, took in the event, took in the opportunity and developed my own thoughts. And you, you know, I didn't have to go and share that with anybody there or, uh, you know, write about it and speak bad about it. You know, again, I, what I disagreed with or anything, again, uh, just take in the experiences and use them to your edification to reflect back to what Edward talked about at the very beginning of the program, uh, that, you know, if it's for your edification, then do it. And if it's edifying the people around you, those that you're gathering with, uh, if I might mention one more thing in this regard, we're studying through uh, church history in our Saturday Bible study here at the Blue Point Bible Church. And recently we've been looking at Justin Martyr's literature. Many of you know Justin Martyr, uh, he comes to us where how we're studying it is by generation. So we're in 110 to 150. And within that period of time, Justin Martyr's first apology comes out. And in his first apology, he explains that the ethic is to find those who agree with you. This is the ethic in the churches. Find those who agree with you and with your conscience and, and you know, th those that you can meet with in a clear conscience and continue to gather with them. Because they did admit early on uh, that, you know, right there in 110 to 150, there's a lot of difference in the Christian community. There's, you know, a lot of people as you're getting more and more people coming into this, the, the knowledge of God, you're going to have a variety of thought. So uh, what Justin Water exhorts is that, you know, you, the, the people find the people they agree with and they meet with them. 
And I think that's leaning right in on what uh, Richard was saying and how we can all walk worthy of our edification. You know, but if I might mention one more thing, um, when it comes to futurism, let's face it, as preterists, there's some preterists that if they even hear somebody mention Jesus is coming back, that you know, the, the hair on the back of their neck stands up and you know they, they're they're ready to you know go to war. Um, for me, I understand why people have come into that view. I understand why people cleave to it um, on many different perspect from many different perspectives. And I've learned to just be comfortable with that. So I go into, I could go to futurist churches. Uh, I could go to futurist pastor meetings. I could go where people have called me a heretic and I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, a man who is intimate with God, this is my Facebook quote. Uh, if a, a man who is intimate with God is not intimidated by man. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't make that my concern. Uh, I have that temperament. I'm able to do that. I've seen and I've brought others with me who do not have that temperament. And, you know, it, it bothers them. It's almost as if they get a stomach ache from listening to futurism. That's okay. Don't meet with them. Don't make that your business. Don't engage that reforming effort. Uh, if it's frustrating you, find things that lead to peace and your edification in the building up of you manifesting the things that make you fruitful and effective in the use of the knowledge of God. Uh, and I believe that that does apply to what our discussion is here today. And again, we gave a very foundational view uh, to these things, uh, the charismatic and the community. But I hope we spoke some maturity to, and I, I don't mean to belittle this brother in, in his statement. Again, I appreciate that he even had discussion. Let's face it. If we're going to welcome discussion, there's going to be people that say things a bit more harshly or brash than the ways that we might encourage them to be said. So I appreciate this brother for sharing his thoughts. I appreciate him for getting Fulfilled Magazine. There's the plug for like the fifth time on today's program. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, get the magazine. And uh, he did that. He, he reads the magazine. He was diligent enough to look into that resource to see where he might agree or disagree. He thinks it's trash. Maybe we need to uh, get some new articles and new insights in Fulfilled Magazine. Uh, I think that's a good idea. I'm actually going to write an article that hopefully won't be referred to as trash. Um, and, uh, you know, again, but let's be careful the way we talk about other people's work and other people's thoughts and uh, appreciate each of us. And I hope that that edifies each of us and urges us toward maturity. Edward, do you have anything you want to say? I know we, we kind of belabored that point this morning further than I wanted to, uh, but I appreciate you, Zach. I appreciate you, Richard. Uh, not that I wanted to, but more than let's say this, and then I plan to, uh, because I appreciate the thoughts that were shared this morning. And I do think that they're foundational to a, a maturing ethic within the preterist movement. I would just like to say with an apologetic, uh, like the gentleman that had shared, you know, he was a little hostile in his, in his verbiage, but um, I, I, I believe, you know, uh, to share the truth in love, you know, right. you know, apologetic, you know, just, you know, share what you've come to understand. You don't have to belittle another individual, right. you know, if you have, if you have, if you feel you have a greater truth, you know, share it, you know, and, uh, and in doing so, don't forget, you know, your principles as far as, you know, you're being identified with Christ, you know, you want to demonstrate that love that he, that he has and the grace that has been given you, you want to extend it to others, you know, so, you know, because grace goes a long way. Amen. Amen. I, I want to make sure, did, uh, Zach, did you exhaust your thoughts? Did you have anything else you wanted to uh, add to that? Uh, well, I could add a lot. I, I guess, but <laughs> it sounds like you. Uh, we've talked about it quite a bit. I, I do. Um, yeah, I just, I just wholeheartedly agree with like your attitude. Um, you and Edward, and it sounds like Richard's attitude towards this. I, this is sort, this is sort of the way forward for preterism is to, you know, seek to talk, seek, seek agreement, seek um, to build up the body. And um, yeah, I mean, I, it's exciting to hear, you know, people voice this and um, to really work into that. It's also, it's not even just, even just seeking to agree, but also to, to equip people where they are. I mean, um, not, not even, I mean, Richard brought up some, you know, differences between what people call what he was calling ritualism and emotionalism and how you should, you know, if you want to go to a certain church that tends towards one part of the, that spectrum or the other, that's great. But I think you should even have, 
go beyond that and think like, how could I, how can I help and equip those on the other side of mm. the spectrum? Um, and, you know, be, let that be the orientation of your heart and how you're dealing with people. Um, I would love to see, you know, preterists going to, you know, each church of whatever denomination in their community and, you know, trying to help all of them and asking how you can pray for the, the Roman Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church or the Charismatic Church in your community. And how can you, you know, learn and understand, you know, what their perspective is and where they're coming from? And how can you, if, if there's something you can do to um, edify them and build them up, you know, where, they're, where they are, do that. And I think it, it's almost the opposite of like, it, it's the opposite of calling people morons. It's like, you know, I know we have disagreements. I know that we, um, you know, we have different personalities and cultures and things that we come from. I mean, I'm a fairly, I'm a pretty uh, ritual type of person. I mean, I'm bringing up secession, secessionism. Like I'm, I don't believe in the secession of, you know, the Lord's Supper and baptism. Um, so, or a lot of the other sort of liturgical things that go on in liturgical churches. And I attend a liturgical church, but um, that is to say, like, if, if you are sort of from a charismatic pers perspective, like, how can you, you know, how can you equip and celebrate and even, you know, critique in love those people in order to build them up. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think like if you're doing rituals without emotion, I think you've sort of missed the plot on what, you know, rituals are about and what they're supposed to be um, instilling in use. And I mean, maybe that's something that, you know, a charismatic uh, Christian can, you know, bring to that con conversation about that. It's like, yeah. because I think you should be, you should be emotionally engaged. And I go to a, you know, a liturgical church that is, Sort of a synthesis between, you know, charismatic, evangelical, and liturgical, and you know, I really value that because the emotion is there, and the, you know, historical continuity and the, you know, the sacramental meaning of, uh, of what we do at the church is there, and it's it, we get the, you know, the best of both worlds in that perspective. So I, so I guess my. My thoughts are like I love what you guys are doing, and I'm I just excited to see, you know, people take up this type of mantle and engage with, you know, the church in this way. Amen. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that, and I and I agree. Uh, I believe that you know it's important to challenge ourselves. I, I want to cast a bit of vision here as we're coming to a close. Um, I'll cast a little bit of vision in regards to, so many of you know, I love, love to network, you know, as the director of the Power of Preterism Network, uh, that's the goal. As I admitted to someone last night, I like to talk about networking, sometimes not necessarily doing the networking. So uh, what I might encourage you is that we're going to work on networking, actual networking, person to person, uh, networking within the Power of Preterism Network. So if you're a part of our network, I look forward to a person to person fellowshipping with you and networking with you. And I say that because one of my goals is to network the preterist movement in a way that it's never been networked before. I believe that's what God ultimately wants to do is bring together brothers. How beautiful it is when brothers stay dwell together in unity. I believe that's uh, Psalm 133, one or somewhere over there. It's in the Psalms. Uh, that being said, um, I believe God has a bigger vision for our lives, for the preterist movement, for Christianity than we, we truly have. I think that's part of that Romans eight ethic that, you know, uh, no mind can conceive, et cetera. Uh, God's always doing bigger and better. And uh, that being said, um, I believe that, you know, God wants to unite the preterist movement where we can have conversations. We can, you know, we talk about this audience relevance, learn from the Jews uh, type of attitude. The Jews were very comfortable with putting a main point on a screen, so to speak, and then allowing 70 different interpretations. Uh, again, all leaning on that one main truth, but finding application in a variety of different ways. Uh, that's big on uh, what Elder Steve Hernandez to make an allusion back to one of our resources. If you visit our website, we have a, we had a discussion with Elder Steve and he continues to bring out that ethic where, you know, we, we need to be comfortable with, again, focusing on the main truth. I'm forgetting the specific Hebrew words, uh, but there's words where they would focus on a specific truth. Uh, and then there was the, um, the interpretation of that truth. Uh, the layers. 
Yeah, it's it's. I'm forgetting the actual. Uh, I have the notes right in front of me. Give me one moment. Let me see if I can find the word that he had used particularly. Uh, I think it was um, Pasha. Pasha, not Parsha. Parsha's the portion, but Pasha is the, uh, the the specific meaning of the text. And then the drash, which is where we get midrash from, is the interpretation of the text. So uh, the, the Jews were very comfortable with that, you know, a variety of different uh, thoughts, et cetera. So um, I think we need to learn a lot from that ethic. And that what I, I, my point was, if we bring the preterist community, all the different voices and leaders and movement shakers, if you will, into a room and we had a conversation, we threw up a truth like soteriology. What are you saying about the work of the spirit of God? Then and today, uh, there would be a variety of difference. What I think would be important is instead of start yelling at each other and never meeting again and calling each other heretic and moron and everything else in the book uh, and splintering, which we've seen Christianity do very well, um, is a splinter constantly, is say, well, how can we find unity in the midst of this chaos and this confusion and this division? And that's what I believe Zach's getting at is how can I enter into a context where I know there might be a lot of disagreement, but I can find agreement. I can work together with these people and even work with them while disagreeing. You know, I think even here on our program, we have plenty of room where we might disagree in specific details. Uh, I pray kneeling sometimes, you know, some people think that's, you know, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to stand in the face of God, um, you know, whatever. Um, you, you know, we could get caught up in all kinds of disagreements uh, that really don't attend to anything. Uh, let's say this, we need to be in the presence of God. Amen. Whether you're kneeling, standing, sitting, you know, uh, slouching, which, you know, again, has a Jewish allusion to the Passover there. Um, again, let's work together. So uh, another thing, uh, the, uh, the reason why I said cast vision, many of you might know, I have a vision of doing a mountain-based conference for the Preterist Movement. And nobody could steal my idea. You heard it here, Mike Miano, Preterist Power Hour. Uh, um, you know, I have a, a vision to do that one day, to host a huge conference where the Preterists gather in the mountains to remember Pella. And um, my goal would be to get all these different leaders. Now, in the mountains, you know, it can be dangerous. So, you know, you're sleeping out there with these folks. And what would have to happen is if you know what, if you're charismatic and you don't like the mumbling, or, you know, speaking in tongues, and I don't want to speak offensively, uh, mumbling, I don't mean that in offensive tone. Um, if you want to speak in tongues, you got to go over there and camp with your folks over there in the mountains, you know, and, and then the, the cessationists could be over there and they're, you know, uh, they're quiet. Uh, what, what do they call it? The frozen chosen crowd over there. And, and that's fine. You, you know, and just learn how to live together, dwell together in unity, uh, you know, but be in the same mountain together, you know, fellowship with one another, have conversation, maybe ex do your style of worship over there and that side of the mountain. And then, you know, we'll be over here on the other side of the mountain. And then there's going to be people like me who kind of navigate between both communities and, you know, say, well, I, when I want to get that infill, I, I, I do need that. I need that. Uh, emotional, charismatic style of worship sometimes. I do that in my personal life. Um, so, you know, I think all of that's important. I saw Richard wanted to make another comment. So, Richard, I'm going to unmute you and uh, let you jump in here. All right. I, you know, I really, I, I, I'm very much in line with you uh, regarding this. Um, but I just want to uh, alert the uh, strong preterists, the cessationists, if people that believe that Jesus is coming is enough to get him up shouting and dancing, you have no idea when the full realization hits them, what's going to happen. Mm. You folks that believe that they should not be shouting or dancing, you may find yourself shouting or dancing when you get in that group, when it really hits them, that, you know, everything's fulfilled. They, they shout over like a third of it being fulfilled or a half of it being fulfilled. You know what I'm saying? Just fasten your seatbelts. Oh, yeah. Because this is an awakening. When it hits you, the glory of it hits you. You know what I'm talking about. There's a point where you, you understand it intellectually. And then there's a point where it really hits you. And you say, wow, you know, this is like, you know, amazing. So uh, to those that are really anti-emotion, just remember that once preterism breaks through, there's going to be a lot of people dancing in aisles <laughs> <laughs> and, As and with good reason, <laughs> with very good reason. All right. That's all I want to say. Amen. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you, Richard. I think about that oftentimes being in some charismatic communities. I do think about that. I'm like, man, if this is what they're doing, waiting for Jesus, 
What happens when they get that full picture of what the presence of God is doing in his people and wants to do through his people? So, uh, yeah, amen. You know, I might be one of those people, by the way, when I see that happening. So, uh, you know, praise God. Um, I'm grateful for this morning. I hope that we aired out some thoughts. We shared some thoughts about the, the charismatic and, uh, you know, I, I like talking about those things. If I might bring us to a close, mentioning some resources. Um, we had a discussion with Larry Siegel last Tuesday, uh, this past Tuesday. And uh, I put up that review and I put up some thoughts from that. Also, some resources that we had mentioned, Ward Fenley, uh, we mentioned him before. Ward Fenley is currently going through a series called Broken to Bold, uh, something to contrite. I'm forgetting uh, the, the exact words, but uh, he has a series up that I'd encourage you to lean in on. I haven't had opportunity to go through it, but, uh, you know, I was thinking about it. I, I agree with Larry. You know, there's so many resources uh, Ward's posting resource after resource. I haven't had opportunity to watch video one. I believe he's at video six. Uh, you know, here you have uh, Jonathan Buttrey. has been, you know, blazing through the New Testament. He had a study on Galatians. They went into Second Thessalonians. Now they're in First Corinthians. I'm like, man, I haven't had opportunity to sit back and watch these resources. So uh, those are some of the new resources that are being produced. Uh, we also have, as I mentioned on the last program, and I'll mention today, uh, the uh, what was it, the 2018, I want to say it was, it was a couple of years back. Uh, no, it wasn't that far back. 2019, uh, Christ in the Kingdom Conference that happened in Temecula, California. Uh, that was Ward Fenley, Tony Gallup, Carrie Burks, and myself and a few others uh, talking about Christ in the Kingdom through Psalms and Proverbs. And I went back and I started reviewing some of those messages because it was this, this season right now, a couple of years ago that that conference had happened. So it popped up on my time hop. And uh, I went back, I started listening to Tony Gallup's message, which, you know, I really do believe God speaks today. And I I'll tell you, um, there's constant things that happen in my life where I could attest to that again and again. Richard alluded to um, a time where, and I've had this happen many times, where prophetic words have truly spoken and rang out uh, in my life. And, you know, I believe, like, for example, I'll give you an example right now. Just last night, Edward and Vicki, you can attest to this. We were talking about in the sanctuary, what happens with, uh, where David in Psalm 73 specifically, he said that, uh, you know, he saw the wicked prospering. Vicky will love that I'm mentioning this, uh, the wicked prospering. And uh, he came into the sanctuary. And then ultimately, the point is, is if I may read the text to you, it's Psalm 73, verse 17. Go ahead and turn there. Again. Bear with me one second. Psalm 73, verse 16 says, when I pondered this to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight until I came into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. And again, this is the point that he saw the wicked prospering, but then he understood the judgment of God as he came into the sanctuary of God. Now, um, what did David see in the sanctuary is a good question. And I say that because that was Tony Gallup's question in his presentation on Psalm 63 at the Temecula Conference, Christ in the Kingdom Conference. And he, he gives that, he gives a presentation on things that are seen, things that are unseen. He made an allusion to Romans 1, which Ward Fenley actually has a good uh, teaching on Romans 1, which usually is erroneously uh, talking about the physical things of the earth and the planet, in contrast to which I think is the proper interpretation, uh, the, the physical things of the old covenant. Um, those things were magnifying the existence of God, the one true God. Uh, so that's where the sanctuary, Edward, Vicki, both of you were a part of that discussion uh, last night in our Bible study. The sanctuary comes from ancient Near Eastern culture. And sanctuary represented where the gods, or where, in our case, the God lived. And um, the point would be that David is in the wilderness, and David is not an Aaronic priest, a Levitical priest that gets to go into the temple. But yet he says he entered into the sanctuary and he perceived their end. And as I mentioned to you last night, uh, I believe this is a spiritual, mental, uh, what's the word I often use? Conceptual change, transition, thought that is going on there. That David, he, he enters into prayer, he enters into the presence of God his mind changes. And uh, that was also reflected in Psalm 63, verse 2. This is what Tony Gallup had brought up in his presentation. Uh, I'll start at verse 1. Oh God, thou art my God. I shall seek thee earnestly. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh yearns for thee 
in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have beheld thee in the sanctuary to see thy power and thy glory, because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise thee. So what happens here is David is looking out at the world, so to speak, and he sees the disaster. He sees the chaos. He sees the world as a dry and weary land. But then when he turns his mind to God, he sees the beauty of what God has provided. Dare I tell us the gospel this morning? Set your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. He who has provided all things pertaining to life and godliness. That's the gospel that we cleave to, that we would look to Christ. And just like we would enter into the sanctuary, so to speak, where we know we, we sing, uh, Edward had reflected this last night in our study, we've been singing about the sanctuary. So my point in all this is, if you've been singing in church for the last month about the sanctuary of God, and then you show up to a Bible study on a Wednesday night, and they bring up the sanctuary of God, and you start talking about Psalm 73, the sanctuary of God, then you wake up on a Thursday morning. And you say you're going to watch some conference videos from Christ in the kingdom. No plan. And you click on Tony Gallup. And I'll tell you why in a minute. You, you tell me God doesn't speak. You click on Tony Gallup and he starts talking about the sanctuary of God. What did David see? Remembering you sang the song a couple months ago or a month ago. You just had a discussion last night. And now here you have Tony Gallup putting before you. What did David see in the sanctuary? For me, I was like, man, I need to start paying attention. God is saying something through this theme. And what do we say? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried, tried and true. That's what we are. God has built us up. He has deposited his presence within us so that we would be the sanctuary of God, the church and the members, the stones, as I believe God dwells in each one of those stones that build up the sanctuary. That's why uh, a little bit of a type here, the, you know, that the temple was supposed to be built with, uh, you know, stones that were not uh, they would often build altars, for that example, altars that stones that were not uh, chiseled by man. Why? Because the Lord made them that way. And if you see that the Lord has made us this way, he has deposited his presence within us uh, and that we would, as he says here, uh, my lips will praise thee. And we know the sacrifice the Lord desires is what? Hebrews 13, the sacrifice of lips giving praise to his name. So praise be to God this morning. Let's praise God for what we've Hopefully what we have saw this morning, we talked about some things, we got some things clear, kind of just had conversation this morning. And I want to praise God for that and uh, want to bring up one more resource. So I say that because I believe God's speaking through that. Uh, there's too many God incidences, if you will, uh, to show that, you know, sanctuary, sanctuary, sanctuary. And then you might say, well, why did Mike go and listen to Tony Gallup, particularly at that conference? And sure enough, uh, Elder Steve Hernandez he had uh, mentioned to us reading through the parasha, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the law of Moses text, the, the uh, prophetic text. And then if you're reading through Messianic Jew parasha, you'll have a New Testament text that's added into that reading. And I've begun doing that. And in this week's portion, uh, we're going through the book of Numbers and we're looking at the, uh, the um, Aaronic and Levitical priesthood. And uh me and Tony Denton and Tony Gallup, excuse me, uh, Tony Denton, another great resource, but that's topic for another time. Tony Gallup, uh, we had talked about the Levitical priesthood, and I want to welcome him on our program. I'm not going to be able to exhaust this this morning, uh, but me and him had talked about the Levitical priesthood. So now catch, catch this. I'm reading, I'm listening to the parasha. I hear about the Levitical priesthood. This morning, I open up the conference stuff for the Christ in the kingdom, and I say, Oh, yeah, I got to get in touch with Tony Gallup and talk to him about the readings through the parasha from Steve Hernandez. And I said, you know what, let me go listen to what Tony had message, talked about at that conference. And maybe some of his thoughts reflect back to that. And sure enough, they do. So, you know, just showing you the sort of the way that I believe God in my life. I love consistency. And I believe God works through that and speaks through that in my life. So I might encourage you to discern the way God's speaking to you. And the different ways that he does that and in the way that, you know, I think we've led in a lot this morning and being comfortable with discerning how God's dealing with you and how that might build you up and hopefully build up those around you. So I share my story. Please go ahead, brother. The kingdom of righteousness, peace and joy. Conceptual. Just right. like entering into the sanctuary. When David entered the sanctuary, it's like us, you know, living in the kingdom being provided everything pertaining to life and godliness. 
uh, where we can uh, uh, see the face of God face to face. We could, uh, you know, make our petitions, uh, hear his voice and things of this nature, you know, uh, in that sense, that's what I wanted to share. Well said, brother. And, you know, I want to let everyone know, uh, and thank you, you know, that our job is to be built up to the best of our ability to make that known. That's what God's been doing for his people since he gave them, since he put them in the Garden of Eden <laughs> with Adam and Eve. It was to the effect to build them up so that they would bless the people around them. I truly believe that the picture of the Garden of Eden, uh, if it were to go a different way, it would have been that Adam listened to God, obeyed God, dwelled in that garden, and then invited others to come and dwell there with him. Uh, all the while giving them the fair warning, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and, uh, you know, and, and teaching that appropriately. So again, that's the flip side of what you see in the story of the Garden of Eden. Uh, but that would have gave man opportunity to boast in his own righteousness, which would have been a problem. So, so our Lord went about this beautiful narrative to show that man cannot lean on his own righteousness, but rather righteousness has been pro provided through Christ our Lord. I want to end our program on a, a, a effort of human solidarity. I believe that's what we need. We need peace in our world, don't we? And I believe the church is those that are going to do that. But I want to go ahead and share a thought with you. Elder Steve Hernandez had said, uh, he talked about Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And uh, I'm very appreciative of the thoughts he often shares. And I'm reading through a book. You could expect a future book review. Um, I'm reading through a book called Morality by Ra Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And he had this to say. And by the way, before I, I say this, and I'm going to close this in a word of prayer, um, you can visit powerofpreterism.wordpress.com or just powerofpreterism.com and access our blog site where we will have all the links to resources that I mentioned on this morning's program and, uh, and different resources that would edify you. You can look forward to the parasha. I'll even bring, I'll give you the link to the uh, specific interpretation of the parasha that I've been reading, uh, listening to that made allusion to the Levitical priesthood. Again, a lot of that, all that and more will be available on the blog for today. Uh, you should go to the power of preterism.wordpress.com and go through the past couple resources we've provided, discussion with Elder Steve Hernandez, a discussion with Larry Siegel and all the resources that are provided in each of those blogs. That being said, this is what Rabbi Jonathan Sachs had to say. Love your neighbor, love the stranger. Hear the cry of the otherwise unheard. Liberate the poor from their poverty. Care for the dignity of all. Let those who have more than they need share their blessings with those who have less. Feed the hungry, house the homeless, and heal the sick in body and mind. Fight injustice, whoever it is done by and whoever it is done against. And do these things because being human, we are bound by a covenant of human solidarity, whatever our color or culture, class or creed, end quote. I pray that you were blessed this morning. Uh, number one, I pray for those in the body of Christ, those preterists out there, I pray that we provided you with an hour of power. I pray if you're a Christian and you're listening to our program, that we provided you with an hour of power that you might study to show yourself approved, you know, diligently putting together the things of God and understanding uh, the powerful presence of preterism and the powerful truth of preterism. And then if you're not a Christian and you're tuned into our program, I, I pray that we provided you with edification and power to discern these things and, and to pray and ask God that he would uh, continue to bless you in, in your study of his scriptures, uh, wherever they might lead. And we know all things work to the, according to his purposes. So uh, we just pray for the edification and the power uh, of his presence to be manifested uh, among all. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to end our show in prayer. Is that cool with you, brother? I just wanted to say one thing with all of the various charismatic and, and, uh, all types of faith ways of receiving the gospel, hopefully we would all agree that we want to keep the concept or the perspective of the proper context of scripture, rightly dividing the word to whereas, you know, we may have layers of different ideas, but we want it to come to the same truth as far as, uh, how the first century author had intended it to be understood and how the recipients had received it. Amen. Amen. Uh, again, may we seek, search, study, and prove the things of God to the best of our ability and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, brother. 
Uh, well, I'll go ahead and close us in prayer. I thank all of you for being a part of our session this morning, whether you're here, zoomed in, calling in, or of course, watching on Facebook Live. Let's pray. Mighty God, we do thank you for the opportunity to gather together. Lord, I thank you for the spirit that you have given us that uh, glorifies you, Lord, that we would endeavor to look to you as author and finisher of our faith. Uh, we thank you for the building up, the maturing that you constantly provide, Lord. And we ask that you continue to help us relish our identity, relish these truths that we have, Lord, and be provoked to share them with others. Be provoked, Lord, to give movement to the movement, to give momentum to the movement, Lord. And uh, we pray that you would just continue to manifest the healing of the nations according to your will and your purposes through us, Lord, that we would turn back and praise you with the fruitful lips, the sacrifice of praise that you desire. Lord, heal our land, bring peace to our lives, bring peace to our world, and continue to encourage us as we look to you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.